All right, you can turn in your Bibles if you have them to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. If the camera isn't on, could uh, someone get it on and recording? I don't remember if uh, I got it there. Thank you guys. Mark chapter 1 is where we're at. We are uh, going through our series, Trademarks. Um, am I loud out there? I feel loud on here, but if you guys are okay, I'm okay. Okay, cool. Uh, how's your guys' ministry going? Can I ask you, how's your ministry going? Good? Bad? Kind of? Some of you guys are looking at blank stares. What? I have a ministry? What? This is how my uh, Grace University professor, Dr. Holmes, New Testament survey, would open class every, it, it seems like every couple weeks this would come up. He'd open class by saying, how's your ministry going? And we'd kind of look at him like, what are you talking about? Some of us worked in churches and volunteered, so it was like, okay, cool, you're asking about that. But he would ask even like people who weren't in a church, weren't pastors, he'd ask, how's your ministry going? And we were so confused, but he'd always bring us to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18. You don't have to turn there. It'll pop up on the screen. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18 tells us that um, tells us God has reconciled us, but I'll show you. Uh, all, all this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. All of this, and you can read back in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 to see what this is about Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. And so I want to let you know tonight, you have a ministry. You have a job to do in the world. You have something to accomplish, and that is the ministry of reconciliation. And Dr. Holmes impressed that on my life and my heart week in, week out, day in, day out in New Testament survey class. And I will never forget those times. And he'd remind me, I have a ministry. Even when I'm not part of a church, even when I'm not serving, I have a ministry. And tonight, I want to give you this same impression. I want to give you the same calling. You guys have some different dreams for your life. You all have different plans. You all have different things you want to accomplish. But I want to let you know your calling is full-time ministry. Wherever you go in life, whatever you do, wherever you end up in, you are called to this, this ministry of reconciliation. Not necessarily from a stage or a platform. I really enjoy standing up here and talking. I enjoy preaching. It's something that's just really fun for me. I enjoy studying. I enjoy the, the whole act of all this right now. It's fun to me. Some of you guys, this is terrifying and you'd hate to be up on this stage. That's okay. Your ministry may not involve a stage, but wherever you are in life, following Jesus, you have a ministry to accomplish. You have a job to accomplish. Your life is about more than just you. You're called to represent Jesus to everyone you meet. In this series, we've been going over four trademarks, four things that signify and show what it looks like to be a Christian. We talked about authentic relationships around Jesus, that we love people like Jesus loves them. We talked about life transformation through Jesus. The longer we follow Jesus, the more we should look like him. Last week, Pastor Gay brought us through audacious faith in Jesus. He told us that, that God speaks, and as God speaks, we move, and as we move, God works. This is what it means to follow Jesus. Audacious faith, obedience to the call of Jesus. When Jesus speaks, you obey every time without fail. And this week, we're talking about bold proclamation for Jesus. And so I just want to kind of break the ice and remind you right at the outset, this is for you. So you might listen to this message and say, well, I don't want to be a pastor, and so I'm just going to tune out this week because bold proclamation is something that pastors do. Bold proclamation is something that missionaries do. Bold proclamation is something that the really super spiritual people that are kind of weird at school do. But I want to tell you, bold proclamation is for all of you. It's so important that we made it one of the four core values. One of the four marks of what it looks like to be a Christian. We have bold proclamation for Jesus. And so I, I want to, in the few minutes we have together, look at what that means and what that is. So a proclamation is a public or official announcement. A proclamation is a public or official announcement. It's something said with power. It's something said with authority. It's something like a presidential speech or a judicial ruling. When, when the judge makes a declaration, this law is unconstitutional. That is a proclamation. It has some power behind it. A, 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 a political statement can be a proclamation. The policy of the United States hereforth is such and such. That's a proclamation. Something changes because of what they've said. A company can announce a policy, and that's a proclamation. From now on, Walmart will sell all colored pencils for $2 a pack. That is a proclamation, and something's going to change as a result. 
It's not just a speech or an announcement or a slogan. There's power behind the words. So Walmart might say, save money, live better. But that's just kind of something they say that doesn't actually change anything. That doesn't save me any money. That doesn't make me live any better. That's just something Walmart likes to say. We even say, we have a slogan we say here, Jesus is better than anything in this world. And that's true. So it's a true slogan, but that doesn't necessarily, just by me saying that, that doesn't necessarily change how you live on a day-to-day basis. Maybe it should. There should be something there. But it's, it's just, it's a statement. A proclamation is something is different in the world as a result of this announcement. A proclamation is a declaration that carries force. A declaration that carries force. You can write that down. Something like the Declaration of Independence. We proclaim these things and now we are doing something different as a result of them. And we expect you to treat us differently as a result. One famous proclamation in American history, Abraham Lincoln made the Emancipation Proclamation to Southern states. And I can some amens for that one. That if you are enslaved in a Southern rebelling state, you are free. And the day after that proclamation goes forth, there's something that is supposed to change. Now, that's maybe a great example of what it looks like when Jesus declares we're free, because they weren't freed eventually. There was some fighting to do. There was some, and there's still some fighting to do to see equality come into our nation. But a proclamation says this is beginning and something's different and something needs to change. There, there's speeches that can be considered proclamations. Martin Luther King says, I have a dream. And he expects that people are going to begin to live their lives differently because of that dream. And, and a proclamation that we make on a weekly basis here is Jesus is king. And as a result of that proclamation, everything in the world has changed. We proclaim that boldly. We proclaim that boldly. See, you are called to bold proclamation for Jesus. You are called to declare the message of Jesus everywhere you go, to everyone you meet, in every circumstance you find yourself in life. You have a message to deliver. And so in order to accomplish this bold proclamation for Jesus, in order to make this happen, you need to know the message. You need to know the message. You can fill that in on your blanks. Know the message. What is the message? What is the message that we are to carry? If you've been in church for a while, you've maybe heard this before. Share the gospel. It's said quite frequently, and and we want to uh, emphasize that. Share the gospel. Pastor Dave has a saying, he, he likes to say, uh, he, he wants you to be found gossiping the gospel in everyday interactions, that you would just, the gospel would be coming out of you, flowing out of you, you'd be sharing the gospel. So what is the gospel? If we're going to really fulfill bold proclamation for Jesus, we need to understand what is the gospel. And, and if I were to ask, I think most of you have already pulled the room, those of you who have been in church or are kind of familiar with it, I, I'd get some different answers. Uh, Some of you would say the gospel is Jesus loves you. And and, and that is a true statement, but that's not quite the gospel. Some of you would say uh, Jesus died for your sins. And that is true, and that is a huge part of the gospel, but it's not the whole gospel. We we use this word, and sometimes we have words like gospel that are kind of religious words, and we use them in church, and we use them in kind of a religious setting, and we hear them so much that they begin to lose kind of the power and the impact. And you hear the word gospel, and it just sounds like another church word. Sounds like another kind of just a a Christian thing that religious people say, and we kind of have a vague idea of what it means. Jesus died for our sins, rose from the dead, and and that is a true statement, and that is a huge part of the gospel, but I think there's something more, and so what I want to invite us to do for a few minutes is to dive in and know the message together. In Mark chapter 1, verse 14 through 15, Jesus begins his ministry, and and this is how Mark records the beginning of of Jesus's ministry. I'm going to turn there. You can turn there in Mark chapter 1, verse 14. Jesus, the, the scripture says, now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying the time was fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. So this is a very interesting verse because it's Mark chapter 1. And if you haven't noticed, we're 14 verses in and Jesus hasn't died yet. Jesus hasn't forgiven any sins yet. Jesus hasn't risen from the dead yet. And so I read this and I'm like, well, what was Jesus preaching? Because I kind of grew up and my understanding of gospel, and this may be true for a lot of you, my understanding of the gospel is Jesus died for my sins and rose from the dead. And yet Jesus manages to preach a gospel without ever having done any of those things. So what's he preaching? Is he preaching that he will die for our sins and raise from the dead? That's possible. But every time we hear him talking about it with the disciples, every time he tells his disciples he's going to die, they're really confused. They're like, what? What did you say, Jesus? I, I haven't heard that before. What's going on? 
And so I find it unlikely to believe that Jesus is preaching this all the time and the disciples just never figured it out. And, and then Jesus dies for our sins, according to the scriptures, and, and he's buried in the tomb and the disciples are just sitting around like, what's coming next? They don't know. They're unclear. And, and so I, I think we can, it's safe, to, it's safe to say that Jesus was not preaching his death and resurrection to the crowds that came and gathered to hear him talk. Jesus was preaching something else what is the gospel that Jesus preached? What, what, what we want to do is let's look at the word gospel and try to understand this because this is, I, I think, probably one of the most important terms for us to get. And, and we should really understand if we're supposed to preach the gospel, what are we supposed to preach? What's the story we're supposed to tell? The word gospel comes from this Hebrew word, beser, or besorah as a noun. And, and this word is a royal proclamation. The, the Greek translates it to euangelion. And that's a compound word, eu, meaning good, and angelion, meaning announcement. A good announcement. Good news. You've probably heard that before. The gospel is good news. A good news announcement. All these words, beser, besora, euangelion, they all mean good news. So beser is, it's national news. It's, it's not just I get a call from my friend who says they won the lottery, but I get a call from my friend who says, hey, President so-and-so has been elected. In fact, there's going to be a beser that goes out in November when we have the election of a new president. A beser is going to come and there's going to be a royal proclamation to the nation. Either one of some candidates are going to be president and there's going to be an announcement. So-and-so is the president. Congratulations. That is a beser. Jesus hears a beser, a messenger, I'm sorry, David hears a messenger beser to him that his army is victorious in battle. This is a royal proclamation. It's, it's a good news announcement with royal national implication. There's a rebellion going on against David and a beser comes and the beser is that he's victorious. He's won. And this is good news, not just for him, but for the entire nation, for all the people. When David dies, his son Solomon takes his place. And when Solomon is crowned king, a besorah goes out, a, a good news, a gospel goes out to the nation. They say, there's a new king in town. There's someone new on the throne. This is good news. Rejoice. Begin to live life differently because there's a new king and we're going to follow his new policies. It's this announcement of a new king. And so a herald spreads the besorah, the gospel, everywhere throughout the nation. After Solomon dies, there's a lot of bad kings. There's a lot of bad news kings. And, and we stop hearing about the Besorah in scripture. When new kings are inaugurated, we simply hear that it happened and, and there's no Besorah that goes to the nation. There's no good news announcement because it's, it's bad news for the people. These kings are corrupt. These kings are violent. They oppress the people. They cause all kinds of problems. And, and eventually they lead the nation into self-destruction. And God's people are exiled in Babylon and there's darkness in the land. But a prophet by the name of Isaiah comes and he besers a Besorah. He proclaims a good news message. He gives a good news announcement that there is a king coming. That the God of Israel himself will become a man and will reign as king over all the nations, over all the world. And he will confront corrupt and violent kingdoms. He will restore his rule over all creation. This is the Besorah of Isaiah. The whole latter half of Isaiah, you can read Isaiah chapter 40 all the way through 55, and you'll get this Besorah, this good news announcement, this gospel announcement. There's a king coming. And when Jesus begins his ministry, he begins by preaching this gospel message. And, and the first gospel message he gives is a quote from Isaiah chapter 4, 18 through 19. Luke chapter 4, 18 through 19, and we'll read it together. Jesus quotes the good news of Isaiah. And he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news. Besora, euangelion in the Greek. Good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind. To set at liberty those who are oppressed and proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. This is the besora of Jesus, the announcement of Jesus. He says, I am the one you've been waiting for. The king that Isaiah promised. The one to sit on the throne of Israel. That is me. I am this ruler. And so now Jesus preaches a euangelion, a good news announcement. An announcement that there's a new king on the throne. That, that Jesus is coming to town. And, and for, for the rest of his ministry, he preaches this euangelion, the gospel of God. Almost every time we hear about Jesus preaching, we hear this word, euangelion. Jesus shares this gospel. He preaches this message. He's the king who will restore God's rule over Israel and over all the nations. So we need to know the message. And the message is this. 
Jesus is King. This is the gospel that we proclaim. This is what we boldly proclaim to the world. This is what we boldly proclaim to all of our friends. Jesus is the king, not just of me, not just of my church, not just of my region, but the king of the world, the king of the universe. Jesus rules and reigns. And so now a new king means a new way of life. And this is what Jesus preaches again and again. He talks about this new way of life as a result of his kingship. You, you can read about it in Matthew chapter 5 through 7. The Sermon on the Mount is the pinnacle example of what Jesus says the new kingdom looks like as this new king takes the throne. And he says, you're going to live life with high moral character. You're going to put down the sword and you're going to seek peace. You're going to live with radical forgiveness and generosity, even towards your enemies. This is the gospel that Jesus proclaims. And the good news that Jesus proclaims requires a decision. You can't just hear the news of Jesus and, and not decide something. You, you have to decide, do you believe this or do you not? Is Jesus the king or is he not the king? Whatever you decide, it's going to change everything. Because if Jesus is the king, you're going to begin to live like he's the king. You're going to begin to act like Jesus is the king. And if you decide Jesus is not the king, you'll continue to live like I'm the king. My government's the king. My political officials are the king. My social media feed is my king. So when you hear the message of Jesus, when people hear the message of Jesus, they have to decide who is the king. Is it Jesus or is it someone else? And so Jesus takes this message into Jerusalem. He takes us to the capital city of Israel and he confronts the corrupt and violent leaders of his day. They're called the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They've controlled the religious system and the political system of his nation. And he confronts them with this message that, that he is the king and he expects life to be carried out differently. He expects the poor to, to be cared for. He expects oppression to cease. He expects people to recognize him as a ruler and live in this new way of life. Rather than executing a revolution or a violent or hostile takeover like we might expect, Jesus comes as a peaceful king. He rides in on a donkey, a symbol of peace instead of a horse, a symbol of war. He comes into the city as a peaceful king, de declaring his rule, and yet at the same time saying, I I'm not going to espouse the violent ways of all the other kings. I'm not going to espouse the corrupt ways of all the other leaders, but I'm coming as a king of peace. I'm coming as a king of love. I'm coming as a king of sacrifice. Jesus is executed by his enemies. They come to this decision point. They decide he's not king. They execute him. And, and, and we're given this picture in the gospel of his execution, and it's a picture of a, a crowning ceremony. He receives a scepter. He receives a crown of thorns. He's given a, a royal robe, and he's mocked, and he's cursed, and, and people make fun of him, and they're pretending that, that oh, you think you're king. Well, we're going to give you this crown of thorns, and we're going to beat you, and we're going to anoint you with all, all these things, and just like, like a king, and they're mocking him and making fun of him. And yet, Jesus is in control on that day. Jesus displays true royal authority by forgiving the very people who mock him. The very people who want to put him to death and execute him, Jesus says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Jesus is the one in control on Good Friday. Jesus is the king when he's being executed and crucified. Jesus is the one in control of the whole situation. And when all the powers of darkness and the evil rulers think they've won, Jesus displays true royal authority. And after his death, a few days later, he comes back to life, demonstrating that he is the true king. That he is the son of God in power, as Romans says. He is the king. His love is stronger than death. And he is the beginning of a new type of people. And through this resurrection, we're given the promise that Jesus will make us like him through the course of our lives. And in the end, we will become just like Jesus. So this is the message. Jesus is the king. But, but he's, he's not a king like the kings of the world. He, he's not a king who oppresses people. He's not a king who uh, attains his position through violence. He's not a king who tries to, to hurt others, but he's a king of peace. He's a king of love. He's a king of radical forgiveness and generosity, a king who takes on the sins of others and forgives them even as they kill God. Jesus forgives them. This is the king. This is Jesus. So this is the message that we carry. This is the message that we proclaim. And maybe you're here tonight, maybe you've never heard this message before. Maybe this is the first time you're hearing this good news announcement. And it is good news because the King Jesus is better than any other king that we would expect to find in our world. The, the rulership and the authority of Jesus is a far better kingdom to live in than the kingdoms of this world and the political structures and powers of our day and age or any other. King Jesus is the true and better king. And so if you've heard this announcement tonight for the first time, 
The announcement of Jesus requires a decision. You can acknowledge him as king, or you can reject him as king and continue living life on your own. The decision is yours in a way, and I pray that the Spirit of God would help you to see Jesus for who he is and recognize him as king. If this is your first time hearing this message, and man, Jesus is my king. Let's talk afterwards. I'd love to hear what that decision looks like for you. I'd love to talk with you about like what that could look like in the future, what it means to live in the kingdom of God. It is good news. It is a good thing to recognize Jesus as king and come into his kingdom. Your sins are forgiven. You have life through Jesus. You have power through Jesus, and he's given you the power to live the way he wants you to live. This is the good news announcement. Maybe you've heard this message a million times. You've grown up in church and you're really familiar with this story of Jesus. And I want to challenge you, proclaim this message. We don't, we we know the message and we proclaim the message. That's your next fill in the blank. We proclaim the message. We get the word evangelist from the same Greek euangelion, the same Greek word. We get the word evangelist. And when an emperor is crowned in the Roman Empire, evangelists would run through the empire proclaiming the gospel. Good news, there's a new emperor. Good news, there's a new king. And evangelists would run, they say, a king is born, a king has come, a new leader has come. And this is where we get this word evangelist. And so you are called to be evangelists. You are to run and go throughout everywhere you are, everywhere, everyone you see, everyone you interact with, every place you show up, you are to declare the message, Jesus is king. He's changed my life. I live under the kingship of Jesus, not the kingship of America. Submit to your governing authorities Follow the laws. I'm not trying to incite a revolution. But it is kind of a revolutionary message that we don't live the way that our world tells us to live. So as much as we can, we follow the laws of our land. We listen to our governing authorities. We submit ourselves to their, to their rule and authority. But sometimes, sometimes they give us rules that go against what Jesus says. They, they, they tell us to do things. They ask us to participate in systems. They ask us to take on attitudes that aren't attitudes according to the kingdom of God. And in those cases, we say, no, Jesus is my king. And I reject your rule and authority because you don't have rule over me. Jesus has rule over me. We live as citizens of this kingdom. And so we proclaim this message to everyone. In the same way, after Jesus rose from the dead, just like these evangelists would go through the Roman Empire and proclaim a new emperor, in the same way, Jesus appears to hundreds of his followers and he commissions them to spread the good news. He says, you are an evangelist. You are euangelionites. Euangelionistas is the Greek word. And so they hear this word. We hear the word evangelist. We think it's kind of a churchy religious word. But they hear this word like, whoa, this is different. This is new. We're proclaiming a new king. We're just like the people on election day that say, man, there's a new president. You're declaring this to everyone you know, and you're talking about it. Hey, did you hear about the election last night? Did you, did you hear about who our new president is? Same way. Hey, did you hear trademark last night? Jesus is our king. We live under a different authority. We live in a different kingdom. We're no longer part of the systems of this world. Did you know? Jesus is the king with all authority in heaven and on earth belongs to him. And so Jesus' followers would talk about what he had done with everyone around them, with everyone they knew, and, and some people they didn't. They would tell the story of how Jesus brought God's kingdom, how he lived for others, how he died for their sins and then was raised from the dead. They'd tell this story everywhere they went. And while it might look like the rulers of this world are in charge, this is what they'd say, it looks like Nero is in control of the government, but really, Jesus is the king. Really, these, these world leaders are just pawns. They, the, the crucified and the risen Jesus is the true king and lord of the world. And so we proclaim the same message. Although it may look like presidents and governors and political officials hold power and do as they please and can choose to respect or disrespect the Bible on a whim and, and do whatever they want, we know who the real king is. We know who's really in charge of all this. We know who's really running the show around here. And they're just pawns in his hand. We proclaim this truth. This task isn't just limited to his disciples. Jesus sends others ahead of him to prepare the way for him to come. You can read about this later in Luke chapter 10. Jesus sends out these people to, to, to share this message and carry out and send it to everyone. Before Jesus would work in a place, before Jesus would come to a town, he'd send disciples out ahead of him to go prepare the way. And so you can think of yourself in this way. And what this, this is good news for you because it takes the pressure off. You don't save people. 
You don't change people's minds. You don't bring people to Jesus. It's not on you to do that. That's something Jesus does. Jesus shows up and he proclaims his message and he tells the word and Jesus forces the decision. All you do is prepare the way. And so you go and you share this gospel. You, you talk about what Jesus has done. You, you talk about who he is, how he lived, what he's done for you, how he's changed your life. You tell this to people. You let them know because this is good news. This is good news for them because you know some people whose lives are going in the wrong direction. You know some people who if they keep living this way, it's not going to be good news for them in the end. You know some people who need to follow someone different because the people they're following, man, they're leading them in a the wrong direction. Maybe this is you and you know, man, I'm, I'm going a direction in my life that I shouldn't be going. And you need to submit to the kingship authority of Jesus. And we just prepare the way. And it doesn't matter if you never convince a single person. It doesn't matter if you never save a single person. It's Jesus who saves them. It's Jesus who does that work. It's Jesus who opens their eyes and opens their heart and softens their heart and helps them to believe the gospel. You just prepare the way. So you, you tell that story and you tell it boldly because it's not on you. It's not about how good you can do it. It's not about how, how po positive or how convincing you can be. It's just about can you tell the story? Can you tell it? Can you tell the truth? Can you be faithful? And if you can do that, you've got it. So know the message. Proclaim the message. We need this so much today with all the social unrest and the disruption in our world. Well, with all the craziness, what a better time to proclaim there is another king. What better time than now to say, hey, I know the world's crazy. I know we have global pandemics and racism and police brutality and cops getting shot and riots in the street and crazy things going on in our world. There's all kinds of stuff going on and it's a mess. But listen, the people who seem like they're in charge, the people who seem like they're causing all these problems, they aren't the real kings. They're the real ones on the show. His name is Jesus, and he has a better world. He wants to come into our broken systems and restore them. He wants to come in, and, and, and he has the solution for our societal problems. Jesus has the solution for racism. Jesus has the solution for anger and, and disquiet. Jesus has the answer to our world's problems. It's in him. It's not in us. It's not through our social programs or, 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 or what we can do, although we fight for justice, all those things. But Jesus is our answer, and Jesus is the one we proclaim as king. Jesus is the solution to our world, and people need to hear this now. Your friends and your family need to hear this message. But, but listen, right after Jesus sends his disciples out, listen to the next words he has for them. You can read this in Matthew chapter 10, verse 7 through 11. We'll turn there now. Matthew 10, verse 7. Jesus says, Proclaim as you go, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand, and heal the sick. Raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You receive without paying, so give without pay. Acquire no gold or silver or copper for your belts, no bag for your journey or two tunics or sandals or a staff, for the laborer deserves his food. And whatever town you enter, or town or village you enter, find out who's worthy in it and stay there until you depart. So Jesus says, proclaim the message, proclaim the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Give this euangelion. But then the whole rest of this is, but it really matters how you live this out. Yeah. It's really matter what you do as you talk. There, there's one verse devoted to, yeah, here's the message. But then these other verses, this whole rest of this passage is make sure that when you tell the story of Jesus, you live like he's actually king. Make sure you don't just say Jesus is king and then live like someone else is, is running the show. So you need to know the message. You need to proclaim the message. But you got to live the message. If you don't live the message, it's meaningless. You've got to live the message. What you say is only as powerful as the way you live, the way you say it. You proclaim a king of love, so make sure you're acting and living in love. You proclaim a king of generosity, and so make sure you act and you live in radical generosity. You proclaim a king who forgives, so make sure you yourself forgive others when they wrong you and they hurt you. Jesus doesn't just care what his disciples say. He cares how they live. He cares how they live. Character matters. This isn't a film of like, you can write this down. Character matters for Christians. And when the church is falling apart, when the church is a mess, it's because we've forgotten that character matters. That when we stand on a stage, when we sit in a chair, people know where we are on Sunday mornings. Your friends know where you are on a Wednesday night. They see you tagging these posts. They see you tagging each other. And so make sure that you tag those friends, but then you live like you're actually a part of Trademark. You live like you're actually acknowledging Jesus as King. You live like this actually matters to you. Because the way you live matters way more than what you say. 
If you say that Jesus is king, but then live like Caesar is king. If you live like, if you say Jesus is king, but then live like, my hope is in political systems. If your Instagram feed is nonstop, sign this petition, join this club, send money to this organization, support this political candidate. You're living like Caesar's king, like political systems are king, like America is king, and Jesus is your king. So check what you're posting, check what you're saying, check what, what you're speaking and how you're leading and, and, and discipling others. If you say Jesus is king, but then live like your social media feed is king, you, you're too afraid to say where you are on a Wednesday night, you're, you're afraid to even tag some people in a trademark post because it's like, eh, church, not that popular, not that cool, maybe I don't want to do it. Who's your king? Is it Jesus or is it your social media feed? I'm not trying to lay some guilt on you. I'm not trying to guilt trip you. So if you're feeling that, I apologize. That's not my goal. I don't want you to feel guilty or terrible, but I want to challenge you to live at a higher level. I want to challenge you to live like Jesus really is your king. That politics is not the king. Money is not the king. My job is not the king. I am not the king. Regardless of what I think in my head or how I think I ought to live or who I think I am, Jesus is my king. And so I live like he calls me to live. We live like this Christian message is true. If people doubt the reality of Jesus, then ask yourself, what am I showing them? If you talk about Jesus as king, if you tell this story of Jesus and people are like, well, is it really true? I don't know. How are you living? Because the early Christians lived it. You can read Acts chapter 2, verse 48 through the rest of the chapter. If you want to know how the early Christians lived, they lived like there was a different king. They lived like we're radically generous. They lived like we're not living for this world. They lived like we're not living for ourselves. They lived a different story. Are you living a different story? If people doubt the reality of Jesus, ask yourself, what Jesus am I showing them? Remember, we said life transformation. I look more like Jesus the longer I follow him. So what am I showing them? Am I looking like Jesus? Am I imaging Jesus well to my friends, my family? So pray for the sick that God might heal them. This is what Jesus says. Pray for the sick. God is a good God. Sometimes he heals people, and that's awesome. We celebrate that. So we do that. We live like Jesus is king. Like sickness is not king. Diseases are not king. Biology is not king. God is king. And so we pray, and we pray here that the coronavirus would end, not because we're some crazy lunatics, but because we believe that God is good and has power over the world and power over diseases. We pray for that. We pray for sick family members. There's people in our church who we prayed for, and they were on the edge of death. And God did a work and a miracle in their life. And some of you know these people. These are your family members. These are your friends. These are your loved ones. And you've seen the power of Jesus. That Jesus does incredible things. So we do this. And then you yourself, you're not Jesus. So you don't heal people, right? But bring healing where you can, where you find hurting and broken people. Bring healing to their lives. This is what Jesus does. He finds the sick. He finds the outcasts. He finds the forgotten of society. He says, hey, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy burdened, and I'll give you rest. Is that the model of your life? Is this how you live? Where there's hurting people, we bring comfort and hope. We share love and peace with others. We're known for generosity. People living in Jesus' kingdom look different than the rest of the world. The real leaders are the servants. The last are the first, and the first go to the back of the line. The hungry are fed. The homeless are welcomed. Love is the most powerful reality of God's kingdom. You may have noticed over the course of this series, these core values kind of flow one into another. We structured them this way on purpose. Because this is kind of the story of the Christian life. That, you know, a lot of, a lot of times this starts with an authentic relationship. It starts with someone invited you to trademark tonight and said, hey, you're going to get 10 bucks and some free pizza, so come. Right. And, and hopefully you've come and you've found that, hey, we are... We have some authentic relationships and we love each other like Jesus loved them. And, and this is a place where you belong. And I just want to say, if this is your first time here and you haven't felt like you're a part of us yet, you haven't felt welcomed, let me know because we need to do better there. We love you. We want you to be a part of us. We want you to be a part of our family. We want you to, to begin to be part of us because these authentic relationships flow into life transformation through Jesus. That the more I'm around other people who follow Jesus, the more I'm a part of a Jesus community, the more my life begins to look like Jesus. The more I follow Jesus, the more my life begins to look like him. And, and if you've got some just stuff going on in your life, keep coming back to Trademark because the more you follow Jesus, the more you look like him. The more Jesus begins to bring you strength and power and comfort in difficult times. The more Jesus' power is available to you, the more you follow him. So keep coming. Stay a part of us. And these, the, the, this life transformation is going to lead to some audacious faith. 
That as your life has changed, as you see Jesus for who he is, you're going to begin to trust him. And you're going to be, begin to be able to take some steps and say, well, I, I, I wasn't able to kill this sin last week, but this week I'm feeling some more power. I've been around Jesus. I've changed a little bit. And so I'm going to make a hard decision. I'm going to cut off that friend. I'm going to stop engaging myself in that sin. I'm going to stop hanging out with those people. I'm, I'm going to make some real radical steps. I'm going to begin to live my life differently. I'm going to begin to live like Jesus told me to live. This takes audacious faith. God's going to speak and I'm going to move. He's going to tell me to, to do something that's way out of my comfort zone. I'm going to do it. God's going to say, pray for that person. I'm going to say, what? Okay, I'm going to do it because my life's been changed and I have some audacious faith now. And that audacious faith just overflows into some bold proclamation that as the power of Jesus wells up inside of you, as you see what he's done, as he changes your life, as you begin to take these audacious, fearless, bold steps of faith, you're going to begin to proclaim this message to others. And I'm so proud of those of you who have proclaimed the message of Jesus to your friends. Who have said, hey, Jesus has changed my life. Come to Trademark and hear about him. Hear how he can change your life. I'm so proud of you guys. Those of you who have invited friends. Those of you who have gone out of your comfort zone. Even though it's difficult and uncomfortable. You've been comfortable being uncomfortable. And you've begun to boldly proclaim this message of Jesus. And so I'm proud of you for that. This is what happens when we live following Jesus. We center our lives about, around him. And so our relationships are authentic. Our, our, our life is transformed. Our faith becomes audacious and, and our proclamation is bold. Something incredible happens when people tell the story of Jesus and start living like he really is the king of the world. That's when this gospel becomes the best news ever. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for this message. Thank you for the good news that you are our king and we don't have to run our own lives. We don't have to live and, and figure out how to, how to live in this world, but you guide us. You show us. You are our king. Lord, I pray that we put our trust in you as king. Lord, I pray for some people here who have maybe heard this message for the very first time. Lord, would you open their eyes and change their hearts and let them see that you are the king, that you are worthy of all our praise and all our worship and all our honor. Our lives flow towards you and through you and for you, Jesus. I pray you'd fill us with boldness, fill us with strength, that we carry this message, we take it, we proclaim it into all the world, to everywhere we go, and in every interaction we have, we will be proud of who you are and what you've done and we believe big things that you can do again jesus we love you we thank you pray you'd fill us and bless us it's for your beautiful name and your glorious name we pray amen amen and we do this every week so you can repeat after me nice and loud jesus, jesus you, are you are better, better than, anything than anything in this world i love you trademark be blessed if you made jesus your king for the first time talk to me after